This folder on the right here is from the Aboriginal Heritage Information Management Services. It was something that I registered to do to conduct all these searches. Now there's only 32 searches and it is doubling up because I did them with a buffer zone and without a buffer zone. But all the other lot numbers produced no results that came up at all. Some of them, like for example, the lot number of a road will not produce any results. So thereby I tested each and every single one of their claims about the heritage sites, the Aboriginal heritage sites, where they were located on which lots, and then I compared them to what they had actually claimed was on the development. And we found that there were shortfalls. They had added and they had omitted, but they certainly were not consistent with the results that could be found with these typical searches and a due, a due diligence search. These fulfill a certain requirement of due diligence, these searches. Now, today I'm not going to be testing the information in that area, I'm going to be testing it in the flora and fauna. So on the right here is Appendix E2, Basic Terrestrial Flora and Fauna Assessment Stage 1. And this is from DA 21-0010. And uh, what number, uh, I think it's page 72. 72, yes. So over here, that starts under this New South Wales Bionet database records. Now, somewhere like these database records are a key place to start, start any research. Because essentially, if there's anything listed in these database records, you have to take them into consideration. Because if you're planning to do something where these records say that there is you know, endangered species and it's such a vulnerable habitat that you have to use this as your base core starting point. What animals are supposed to be in the area? Now this is a Bionet database that actually exists of recorded sightings of plants, mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, some fish and some mainly endangered invertebrates. So these records are not they might be in the area. These records are they have been sighted. So I don't know why I'm surprised but Bionet Atlas is a searchable database. There is a public part of it that you can use it is clear through looking at this report that I cannot actually do publicly that there is a section where if I suppose you're a town planner like um, Planet Consulting you would have a log on and there would be more features for your subscription into that where you can do more specific searches. For me I had to get a whole report and then find all the ones that were vulnerable, endangered and protected, which isn't too difficult to do. But anyway, so to test their information, their core information that they started with, they say that on the 3rd of December 2019, when this report was generated, there was 321 records of 54 species. And this is only for all valid records of threatened, threatened species. It's not, as I'm going to do over here, the all entities. Now there is a reason for that and it's because I've already tried this out and it doesn't matter if I click on any of these others to give a specific one, it will come up with no results. And you know they're in there because you've got this list, it's got all of these in there. So it's very misleading in that way. So ultimately, you've just got to do it uh, the hard way yourself. Well, not the hard way, because um, 
there are easy ways to take a lot of information and uh, analyze it very quickly. But anyway, so this is the search page that will produce this report. Now what I did, and I've already opened it up and put in the um, coordinates in the next box for convenience, but you click on define my own area and it'll click up with this box and there'll be nothing in there and what you're doing is basically and if you want to find anywhere I will leave as I said I will leave a link for this if just use Google Earth and hover over a spot and look what it says in the 153 area and the 28 and sort of go around the area and you can get your coordinates that way and that's what I originally did because I'd forgotten well I went to the BioNet but I wasn't really paying attention to their coordinates I set my own parameters and I can understand why they've moved their square where the Kyogre Road is actually dividing this huge square this square should actually be further north and a little bit further east so that it covers the development area in a more realistic term sort of like over here not down here where it's covering all this wildlife that they can then turn around and go well we haven't seen that here so um, yeah we don't have to worry about any threatened species which is exactly what they've actually done so if you actually look at page 38 of the same appendix you will see that they Yes, we've got 48 species threatened, previously recorded, you know. But we looked at their range and preferred habitat and said, well, you know, they're not really here and, they, and, and we don't think that they're going to actually rely on the habitat. That they could go somewhere else. They're not relying on it. It's not like a, a life and death situation. So subsequently, several such threatened species are considered unlikely to be significantly affected by our future development. So isn't that an interesting way of saying we don't care? But I suppose this is what these town planners get paid to come up with, isn't it? how you can move the location because in moving this location I will show you in the search in a sec but um, once you plug in these coordinates you click show extent and it will show this little red box it will actually be on the state of New South Wales you'll need to see where that little red box is and you'll need to zoom in on it now when you're happy you can change these like I'll just show you, I'll change that to 09. You can see out it goes. So all you have to do to change your parameters is just to keep changing these things. Then when you're happy that that's the area that you want to look at, you go use that extent. Just click OK because it says, yeah, you've got to do a certain area. And then you go down here because it's plugged in your coordinates now and you submit search and it comes back with 712 species it says 3438 records of 712 species now just to show you what I mean I'll click here endangered populations so it comes up with no records found and you just back here on the page and yes this is what it did last time too sorry one second okay so I just had to do the search again put the coordinates in because I don't know it does doesn't reset but no matter which one of those you click on it comes up with nothing and yet yes there's endangered populations it's at the top of the list so just doing the all entities so they came up with 712 species and of those 712 planet are saying that 54 species 
and 321 of those records are actually vulnerable species or threatened species. So if you notice there's a little button here that says download records, save species list. Now I'm going to save the species list and it will download an XLS for me. Hang on. Okay, so I've just opened up the XLS and this is the species report for that area that I just designated and did a search on. And as you see, you can go through there. There is, well, there will be 3,438 records for 712 species. So there should only be 712 listings because they record the records of all the sightings are down the side. As, there's some interesting descriptions as you get down through some of them because somebody saw a possum-like thing but they couldn't actually identify what kind of a thing it is. So they do have random we don't know but it was somewhere in the ballpark of it looked like. But here in 2021 when we've done this report that's been generated on the 11th of March 2021 at 10.33pm and compare it to this report you can actually see whether there has been an increase in activity. Some of them I've actually noticed that records have disappeared and I've actually wondered why that was. But um, if you look at things like the giant barred frog, there was 28 records. There's 28 records now. There was 28 records then. So this would actually indicate that it's not commonly seen and maybe why it is more on the endangered list. It's interesting they even have um, cane toads listed on here but they are neither protected <laughs> nor anything. Uh, so they will actually bring up species that have been identified. You will even get cats, dogs, foxes, any species that has been identified and reported will be on this BioNet database. Now one of the reasons for them actually claiming that there is you know, well, where these animals are, they're not reliant upon it, is because out of those 712 species, there are a large number of birds. Now, most of these rainforest birds actually like rainforests, not um, paddocks and things like that. And when you're talking about, well, um, we don't think that we're going to be taking away that, you know, look, like ultimately, yeah, they can go somewhere else. It's not like, you know, it's the only stuff around that they can live on or that they can breed in, you know, there's, they, they can go other places. You know, this isn't the only place they could be. And that's a really pathetic excuse. See, as far as I'm concerned, this species list should have actually formed part of the development application. Then it actually shows which ones have been specifically identified within the area and then what measures are going to be taken to avoid any impact. Like even to propose moving the wildlife corridor, if it has any impact, any negative impact on the environment or the animals, it cannot be considered. And you cannot reduce the animal habitat by so much and say it's not going to affect it. And you cannot take away so much habitat, which includes vulnerable and endangered flora, and say it's not going to impact on it. Everything they do is going to have an impact. How bad that is depends on how much they're allowed to get away with. Now, I haven't analysed their information as a duplicate to this yet. 
because I first did my own search on where I expected this is the development area what can be realistically found in there what has been reported as been cited now I'll just bring that one up so the search I did brought back all the records valid records for the selected area and I'll show you that selected area in a, in a second and it returned a total of 6,956 records with 783 species. Now, I want to draw your attention here to the fact that this now says 783 species. They are working on 712. If you look here at the giant barred frog, there are 37 records, not... 28. So when you move the boundaries of the actual development area to where it more accurately represents things, you can see at the very core of their information, they are using figures that are not based around the development. As I showed you, that only a small top corner of that square would actually be applicable to the development. Over half of it was over Kyogle Road and has nothing to do with the development. And when it borders, one second, so when it borders all these national parks and natural bush, uh, the animals are going to be roaming here. They're not going to feel so secure to one, cross the river, and then the road. So to actually include wildlife that, and if you take a look at the area that they've now cornered off, you can see that a large amount of the uh, square that you look at what's in there, a lot of it is cleared land. So of course the numbers are going to be lower and thereby it will indicate the presence of lower populations. Because the square, you, and you can tell easily because this kink where um, Mount Burrell Commercial is and right here where it goes up to 3222, it's a very distinctive part in maps. And it's nearly, you know, it's between Kunga and Mount Burrell, they're always marked. So you can pretty well define your area you know that you are not going well I'm going all over the place there but define your area into a smaller part that is not actually going to include all of this uh, already cleared land where well of course there's not going to be wildlife recordings there you know they they're grazing paddocks or things like that and and the farmer's not going to notice, he's not going to ring up and report, oh, look, I saw this bird and I saw that and this. and But they are there anyway. But even so, the prevalence of native populations in a habitat should be judged in the condition that it is actually found. And when you're using all of this cleared land to give up the results to say, well, there's only 712 species in that little square. Well, I'm going to take it back now and I'm going to bring up these coordinates over here and show you the square that is what I believe is more accurately representing the nightcap on Minjimbul development. And if I wanted to, and I was a town planner, I could move it a few degrees this way and that way and make it look like it does now so that I could include cleared paddocks where there would be no mentions of sightings, you know, people aren't going to bother. And so the numbers of the types of species that might be endangered or vulnerable is going to considerably drop. Then you also have um, migratory birds that might actually come in and nest and use these areas. But most of the birds in these surveys live in the bush. You know, it's not like they just 
coming up from the coast each day and go, oh, yes, I'm going fruit picking here or something, whatever. They live in the bush. So to even say that, oh, well, we're not going to take the birds into consideration because they can go somewhere else. Well, not if you keep taking away everything of where they can go, there will be nowhere else to go. And this is the whole point about, you know, this attitude of, well, you know, there's somewhere else for them to go. So we're not, in, you know, they're not relying on us as on this development as food or home or habitat. Yes, it is. There are over 783 species that have been sighted that rely on this habitat. They rely on it. Okay? It's not a choice. They rely on it. Okay, so I've just plugged in the coordinates there. I'll go show extent. See the little red box? This is what it looks like when you first open up the map before you start plugging in coordinates. And then you zoom in. Oops. Now, because you have to do a, um, a 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer search, you do have to include a larger area. But as you can see here, I've actually moved it more over into the area because here, down here is Mount Burrell um, shop and up here is Mandalay Road. So this area here is the impact area, but it covers this whole area, which is far better than having the box down here where it was and covering all this other area. An area, this to me, this area is far more applicable to the development application, uh, the development itself, because it actually covers all the land that would be developed. And it also starts to consider the national parks. It was cutting off too much of this whole area is all inclusive. It's not like these animals go, oh, well, that's someone's private land. We're not going on there. It's their home. They don't know any borders. We're the only ones that create borders. They do, however, understand territory and competing for it. So I suppose animals and human beings are hmm, fairly similar in a lot of ways. So use extent, go on, it applies it, submit my search and it comes up with my 783 species. And when I click Save Species, this is the report I did. So then you've got a whole different set of base information to work with. They had 712. I've now got 783. And of those, uh, one second. Now this is just a basic thing that I did that it turns out that of that those 783 species 14 are endangered species 48 are vulnerable species and there is 268 protected species so that's a lot of species that are protected vulnerable and endangered in that area and what's planet's response to that? Nah, we don't think it's going to impact them much at all because, you know, they've got other places they can go. Well, maybe animals, and birds and things like that, maybe you can kick them out and they can survive. What are you going to uproot and transplant every vulnerable, endangered and protected species of plant? Are you going to do that? No, you'll just bring in the bulldozer. You'll build over it. You don't care. One of the most, one of the biggest pockets of vulnerable and endangered flora is where you intend to take away the most. Let me show you. Well, I put on two overlays here to try and bring out the information more so you can see. But this area down here, is going to be completely devastated because each one of these houses 
for where they've been allocated for exclusive use can only be an acre. And if you've got to clear an acre around each house, this whole area here is just going to be stripped bare. So any vegetation in the area is going to be destroyed. Or do you intend to come in there and transplant, safely transplant these plants to a different area? And in doing so, you have actually destroyed very valuable and unique ecology. Because these things that are growing here are not, even though they might be the same species as the one that might even be over here, they have created a subspecies to adapt to that particular ecosystem. And if you move them from one place to another, the chances of successfully um, putting them into that environment, they're going to struggle because they are not adapted to that environment. You can't just go uprooting them. So even if you would propose that all these vulnerable and endangered plant and flora are relocated, you still cannot do it successfully because then you would be, I, I know this because I, um, well, years ago when I was going to, I've done it through university, I've done it through TAFE and tech and all these places that um, you can have your gum tree on one side of the hill. It's got a lot more wind, it's more exposed, it gets more rain, it's colder or whatever. To the tree on the other side of the hill that gets more sunshine, it's more sheltered, it's actually got more, um, you know, richness in the soil to feed it and everything. And those two trees, even though they came from, they might have been grown from the same tree seed, they have become unique in their own ecology. And every single plant creates their own unique subspecies within the ecological system. This is how plants have such diversity and why that scientists could take any of these red dots and compare them under a microscope at a very molecular and um, I suppose DNA level if you want to look at it that way and say right are they the same? They're supposed to be the same, they are the same but there are slight differences and that's how nature creates diversity because we think of plants as static because they don't move around anywhere but they are very vibrant and they are very much um, able to adapt in real time to their environment and become distinctly their own species or subspecies. And it is this kind of rich environment where this biodiversity can be created through the generations that is being sought to be destroyed. You know, once you destroy it, it's gone. And, you know, we've got, we've just got to stop. Somewhere we have to stop. You can't just keep going until there's no trees left. You know, it's, it's got a point where you've got to just say no. And I think everybody agrees that this is a no-go proposition. Not only for the human beings, but for the animals, for the plants, for the environment and just for the well-being of the whole ecosystem. I mean, you know, they don't even look, when they look at biodiversity, they're not even thinking about the abundance of insects and other things like that. that I didn't even see one mention of butterflies or bees or, you know, anything else. But these things are vital for a balanced ecosystem. The, you know, all the bugs the beetles, the spiders, you know, people, oh, well, you know, they're creepy crawlies, who cares? Everything has got a place in nature and it's balance. And when you're considering an ecosystem with only half the population, 
when you're not considering even the microorganisms that are in the soil, how you can destroy the microbiotic actions in the soil, which I dare say a lot has already been destroyed because of the pesticide use. You know, people aren't going to go and dig out the weeds. They're just going to go and spray poison on it. And, yeah, ugh, I hate poisons. I refuse. I, I do not use them. If you cannot pull out something that you don't want growing there, what, you're going to kill the whole ground and contaminate everything because you're too lazy? I mean, it actually takes more effort to go get a poison bottle and spray it and wait for it to die to create a fire hazard than it would be to just pull it out right there and then. You know, people that use poisons are lazy. Mind you, on a large scale basis where you've got long grasses growing along things, yeah, I agree with a certain degree of usage, but in a way, no, because I've all also studied all the different types of pesticides and how they work and why they work. And even the withholding periods that they say on the MSDS, they, they are an average and yeah, they don't quite tell you the truth. It's like all of these chemicals that they use, like they'd come in and they'd spray for termites or something like that. And it might say, oh, you can't go around that for 24 hours. When in actual fact, really, um, it's going to have residuals there for um, ever now. It, there is a low grade risk, but because it's under that set level, they don't have to declare that. And they say, nah, it's gone now. No, it's not gone. There's traces of it. And all that pesticide that has been used... Maybe that's why these dam waters are so disgusting. It, we, there is nothing to know how much heavy use has been done on the land rather than getting out a tractor or going in and, you know, using a bulldozer to get rid of some lantana or something like that instead of what you use it for. I'm sure they wouldn't mind if you got rid of that. So, back to the flora and fauna list. See, the thing about paperwork and database lists, and I suppose like any scientific experiment, if you set down certain parameters, the test can only be conducted within those parameters. And then once you've established those parameters, you can then establish other ways to look at the information so that it will support what you want to find out about it. And this, well, this to me actually appears to be what they have actually done with the report on the basic terrestrial, terrestrial flora and fauna assessment. Essentially, there should be a complete list of 783 species not 712. The parameters of the search that they laid down in the first place is covering too much cleared land and it is not inclusive enough of the habitat that they would actually be impinging on. And there is also the conspicuous disregard for, well, what does it mean that something is a protected species? What does it mean if it's vulnerable or endangered? If you can have someone like Planet Consulting come along and say what they do, we don't need to worry about it because, you know, they're not relying on it. I suppose Planet can actually try and explain anything any way they like. Because so they don't have to worry about water catchment and the effects of grey water and storm water and everything on the water catchment and everything. They looked at the Gold Coast and Logan councils in Queensland and said they have these rules and we like the way they think about that. So, you know, because your develops, development, this development's in New South Wales. Yeah, we know that. But 
because these two say that it's it's okay and you're only one we're going to go with the ones that say two the two that say that it's okay not to do any of this we're going to say that's fine i just can't understand planet doing that how can you turn around and use logan council and gold coast council seriously They've got hardly any bush left. <laughs> Gold Coast City Council, I mean, Sin City, all the, the high rises and everything. Are you kidding me? You're going to compare the Gold Coast to the country and say, well, the rules that apply on the Gold Coast should apply to the country because they say it's okay to ignore those kinds of things. We can ignore them in New South Wales. In another state, in another local council area, because we like what Gold Coast and Logan Council say. That is the height of arrogance and stupidity and lack of professionalism that you could even submit a report with that stupidity in there. That you could even think that that's a justification for not doing something. You're submitting it in New South Wales to the Tweed Shire Council or the National Regional, uh, the Northern Regional Planning Panel, not in Queensland. The Logan Council and the Gold Coast Council, what they do is none of any of their business. They don't care. They do not want this area to turn into something that looks like the Gold Coast or Logan, for crying out loud. Are you kidding me? Is this the intent of what you have for this place, to create something like the Gold Coast and Logan out of this beautiful country? Is that what you really intend? To put up another... <laughs> oh, well, it's a place where people flock to the Gold Coast because they have dreams and there's this illusion and it's all full of broken dreams and, well, it's not a nice place. Lived there for too long. So I'm going to leave it on that anyway. I've um, brought up the, well, the lack of due diligence as far as I'm concerned by Planet Consulting. To take it seriously, the impact that this development will actually have on the environment, on the endangered, the vulnerable and the protected species. Let's recap here. 268 protected species, 48 vulnerable species and 14 endangered species. And these are actually sightings. Now, whether that can be backed up by their little individual surveys with the conspicuous absence of, oh, look, where that wildlife corridor currently is, we've, we've got no records of any animals there. Isn't that amazing? Well, how convenient. Now it won't matter if we build over there because we won't be kicking any animals out of their home. Oh, what a load of... Okay, so I'm just going to remind people that on Sunday the 14th at, oh, well, from 12 till 3 at the Ukai Hall, there's the community meeting on NICAP or Minjimbal to discuss and help with how to word submissions. The Northern Rivers Guardians have hosted this event and there will be many people in attendance there. Uh, Mayor Chris Sherry will be showing up as she is very keenly interested in this development application for very much the same reasons as what you and I are too. Now, yes, this that's just a reminder, but if it keeps raining, well, this is Mandalay Road today. It's um, This is the bridge, one of the bridges that needs upgrading and that bridge from what I've seen has flooded oh correct me if I'm wrong four maybe five times since October 
last year could be incorrect but there are definitely a lot of times from October last year to now that this bridge has been flooded and in some photographs I've actually shown you the water's been right up here you you wouldn't even know that the bridge existed under there so this is what the bridge looks like now also one of the reasons why the bridge upgrades are essential it's just too low it needs to be raised in fact for it to be accessible it would need to be raised to really at least here because I've seen it where I think well even further would be but generally the water can when it comes up and it swells it can come up very quickly but then I don't need to tell you do I <laughs> you know unless you're new to the area and you've come from the city and you've got no idea unless you're experienced I wouldn't even try and cross that you can still see the um, water the concrete sides there so it's not too deep but if you're not prepared for that force and there is a force going through there um, yes there was another photograph where one guy his car stalled and he ended up in it and had to get rescued and it took all these other people so trying to cross flood waters can be a risky thing especially if you do not have a reliable vehicle and if you have got just well if you're not in a four-wheel drive I wouldn't even really consider it and even in a four-wheel drive you know you just hire off getting in trouble it doesn't mean that you can't get into it <laughs> anyway so if you haven't got anything planned for Sunday go down to Yukai meet up with fellow community members down there have a chat and yes as I said Mayor Chris Sherry she'll be in attendance so I dare say she'd be happy to answer any questions that anyone has but also you need to remember too that a lot of the questions that we have well I know that I've asked council certain questions in emails and it's questions they can't actually answer they have to then they have to take your question and go to the developers and say well can you answer this now so if you're not actually getting an answer to your emails it may be because they don't have the answers to give you and yes I suppose I've actually thought a bit in that respect too is that I send them in with all these questions for them to answer when it's not their development application it's an ICAP on Mingenbull by NCV Enterprises they're the ones that need to answer the questions so I dare say council has got just as many questions as what we have and in fact I know they have the matter of the capital expenditure or the civil construction costs has actually been raised with them to actually address that and if they are to modify that and submit correct costings they will no longer be heard by the national reg the north why do i keep calling it national northern regional planning panel so it is i had it confirmed today that the it is 30 million threshold over 30 million it goes to the northern regional planning panel under it it stays with the local authority so if nightcap on Minjimbal are made to correct their civil construction costs to be accurate it will then be under 30 million and the approval authority will then revert back to the council and this is actually what should be done because if anybody accepts those cost expenditures that they have put down as valid uh, well let's just say I wouldn't like the accountant keeping my books like that unless of course he was keeping them to hide stuff from me for me not from me <laughs> got that wrong didn't I anyway show up Sunday if you're going to be out and about and if you can get out and about I hope the rain stops <laughs> as it is people are already flooded in 
but we also know as quickly as it rises it can drop down as well just be careful out there and do not take any risks crossing flood waters i'll talk to you next time bye